I'd also like to um, pay a particular acknowledgement to Professor John Lester, who I've known for many years, I won't say how many, because we'll age us both, and, um, but he's been a real trailblazer in the field of education. If it wasn't for the work of John's generation, making the access to education, particularly tertiary education, for my generation so much easier, I wouldn't have had the long list of accolades that we just read out. So I'd really like to pay my respects to John and his generation for what they've done for mine. Um, and I'd also like to thank the Hunter Valley Research Foundation for asking me here tonight. It was very tempting to come here and just in such a lovely part of the world that I visit often, um, partly because of the extensive role the university here plays in Indigenous education, but because I like the idea of public debate about civil society, I think that debate about what kind of community we should have is a really important one, and one that shouldn't just be safe for academics. So it was very tempting to, um, to be here to contribute to a public debate about this issue. So I won't just start by putting my cards on the table and say that when I'm often pressed to say what sort of society I would like to see, what's my vision, I often um, ponder that. And for me, I would sum it up, I guess, as an Australia where all Australians feel that Aboriginal history and culture is part of the broader Australian history and culture, that we're not so much on the periphery, but a part of the central um, aspects of Australian life and um, Australian culture. So that's sort of, I guess, what I would um, articulate as a vision, um, but I think one of the um, key issues that face us in terms of thinking about a civil society generally, whether you agree with my vision or not, is the fact that in a society as lucky and in many ways wealthy as ours, that it remains a challenge as to how we continue to include the most disadvantaged. And in this way, I think Indigenous Australia becomes a litmus test for um, our performance in that area as a historically marginalised, culturally distinct, and our most socioeconomic disadvantaged community. So, whether you agree with my vision about the centrality of Aboriginal people and their culture, um, I think most of us would agree in an Australia that offers a fair go for everyone. And in either of those um, conceptualisations, the challenge of, I guess, of what's become known as closing the gap is um, a key challenge for us to think about. Um, I'd just say one thing from my perspective about the Close the Gap campaign. I think it's an incredibly important idea, and a very simple one, that on key issues like education, employment, health and housing, um, that we like to aim for an Australia where the opportunities um, for Aboriginal Australia match those of the rest of the community. But I would just make this one caution about the Close the Gap um, agenda as we currently conceptualise it. And if you um, think about the vision I put forward about Aboriginal culture and history being central to the Australian um, history and culture, the one thing that's missing from the Close the Gap agenda is an understanding or a, a way of measuring our protection of Aboriginal culture and knowledge and the transmission of Aboriginal culture. So I do think, while well, I'm going to focus very much on the Close the Gap agenda by focusing on one of those areas of education, I'd just like to qualify that and say that I think that we need to think about things like the preservation of language, the preservation of art, the preservation of Indigenous knowledge, not just the preservation of their transmission and their regeneration as well as part of a broader um, campaign. Um, but let me start by the, with the other aspect of the Close the Gap agenda is that it's often looked at in terms of silos, partly because the way we bureaucratise particular issues they tend to be dealt with as housing, education, employment, um, etc. And as a result, we tend to think of each of these issues in terms of a particular silo that they might be in. And I think it's impossible to think about the challenges around education, which of course start with the education of children in particular, 
without thinking about the interconnectedness of all of those different aspects. I mean, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with the concept of a cycle of poverty, but that plays out very centrally when we look at some of the impediments to getting better outcomes in Indigenous education for our young people. Um, in particular, um, the overcrowding, the shortage of housing in Aboriginal communities leads to a range of complications in terms of education. Some of these are related to health, um, another aspect of our um, Close the Gap agenda. Overcrowding increases the risk of infectious diseases and increases the likelihood of poor hygiene. There's also a statistical correlation between overcrowding and neglect of children. So there are a range of ways in which overcrowding, the issue of housing and the issue of health interrelate. And a further example, I think, of that interrelatedness is that one issue that comes up often, particularly in remote Aboriginal communities, around the failure to engage children with schooling um, has shown to be that often they have undetected um, infections in their ears, which makes it difficult for them to hear. It's an extraordinarily simple issue that explains a high level of disengagement within Indigenous communities and a reflection of the fact that if we're not providing adequate health care, it complicates issues like um, education. So I think the first thing to remember that in looking at one particular area of the Close the Gap, we need to be mindful of the fact that this is actually a holistic exercise. In some ways, if we focus on just one part of that agenda, um, we're never going to be able to really solve the problem um, from as a start. Um, so just to give you a bit of a snapshot of um, the statistical data, and don't want to get too much into the statistics, um, I think you can get bogged down in them, and as you know, they're often open to question, but I just think that there's a couple of points that I think help illustrate the broadness of the problem and how um, deep down we have to go to start addressing issues of disadvantage, especially around the issue of education. Um, if you look at the percentage within the Aboriginal community compared to the non-Aboriginal community of people who leave before year nine, the year nine schooling, 18% of um, the Australian community does, but 34% of the Aboriginal community does. So almost a third of our community leaves school before year nine. Um, and in relation to the of year 12, um, almost half of um, Australians finish year 12, only 22% of our students who have remained in, in school remain, uh, will graduate to year 12. And when you consider that this is a small population, um, it gets the, those actual figures are uh, even smaller than what the percentages would imply. If you look at higher education as well, um, there's this particularly interesting challenge there. There's now 11,000 Aboriginal students throughout the higher education system in Australia, which is on the, on the face of it, and, um, you know, a good number and it's increasing. But because the general population of the um, universities has increased so dramatically, um, whereas that population level within our community um, that is eligible for university to attend university is about 2.2% of the general population. We're only still 1.3% of the um, university population. So even though you can sometimes see an increase in the actual numbers, when you look at the statistics in percentages, they're not actually showing a rate of improvement that matches the rest of Australia. Um, but the main thing you would have already picked up with that figure about the number of people who leave, children who leave the school system before completing Year 9, um, is that the issue of um, Indigenous education is one that has to start really early. Already by high school, most Indigenous, statistically, many Indigenous students will be well behind their contemporaries in literacy, more so in numeracy, and even more so in relation to science. 
So I think one of the things that that then highlights is that the um, there's been a lot of increased activity with mentoring bright students who are in year 11 and 12 into universities, but it highlights the fact that perhaps more energy needs to be spent on partnerships with universities and professions that look at the activities between year 7 and 8 um, and engage children, particularly with maths and science. And one thing you find when you look at where students sit within the higher education sector is that you see a lot more students in medicine and health, in um, education, in and in law. And one reason we think we can explain that those clusters is because when students think about what they want to do, they want to do something that they can see will have a direct impact on their own communities. And they see doctors, they see teachers, they see lawyers. And it's so those professions are immediately, it's immediately apparent to students um, why those are important um, for community, for their own communities. And perhaps it's less obvious why things like accounting or engineering, which are also of course important in all communities, would be important to theirs. So I think there's a role that the professions can play in terms of that early mentoring, but there's no doubt there needs to be much more focus on the development of those skill sets from year 7 to year 9, or the pathway um, is then um, uh, going to be too difficult. In fact, um, one interesting observation um, that I heard from um, a professor at the University of Sydney um, who uh, works in um, the sciences, she said it's easier to have a student, it's easier to have a student um, come through and support them and graduate if they failed at maths than if they've never done maths at all. So the catch up um, is enormous and a real barrier. There's an additional problem within um, some of this pathway that I'm talking about that has been picked up by the work of um, educationalist Chris Sara, himself a school principal, um, and now um, one of our sort of leading educators of principals. And he has observed that one of the real difficulties um, that he sees that's kind of systemic is that often teachers themselves have low expectations of children and that that then becomes almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. The, um, the programs he has developed um, include both, I guess, training pr principals as the leaders in schools to shift their expectations and therefore change the culture of the school more generally. I think that's a, it's a very commendable approach, also a very slow one. But he also has um, developed programs that link um, the building of self-esteem and aspiration within children with an expectation of their academic performance. And I think what's interesting and important about the models that he looks at is that he understands that part of the process of engaging children with education is not just about um, getting them to perform well at school, but there's a whole aspect of their own self-confidence. And one of the most successful ways that Chris Zara's programs have been able to build that self-confidence up is to engage with programs that um, have children engage with their culture as a source of pride, that gives them a strong sense of identity and a strong sense of self. Um, it, it, it wouldn't be complete to actually identify another challenge we find um, among young people. don't think this is particular to Indigenous communities, but it certainly is um, an issue that we look at. Though there's often an assumption that it's perhaps the view of Aboriginal parents that education is important, um, we haven't seen a lot of evidence that that is a driving force. But what does seem to be clear is that there is a peer group pressure, particularly on boys, that says it's kind of uncool to study. And in particularly dysfunctional communities where there are high crime rates, particularly of juvenile crime, a very worrying um, trend where um, it's often seen as a rite of passage to have some contact with the criminal justice system. And these can seem quite overwhelming, but if I can just give you a more positive story from my own community in Redford, which many of you will immediately think is, continues to be a basket case community and certainly must be one of the most um, renowned um, communities in the country, particularly because it's perceived as having a, crime, a high crime rate. 
but the rates of juvenile crime within the Redfern community have dropped drastically, even though in neighbouring areas of Marrickville and Glebe and Kings Cross they continue to be high. And the drop in that um, crime rate, particularly amongst juvenile crimes, especially with boys, um, has been the development of two programs over time, so it hasn't just been a quick thing, but um, over seven to ten years with both of these programs. One is a very simple after school program run by a fellow called Mick Mundy who has a gym that the boys go to to do training. It teaches them to be respectful of their body and their health, and, um, but they also engage in these, in these programs there. And the other run by another um, Aboriginal community leader, Shane Phillips, who runs an enterprise called um, the Tribal Warrior, which is a ship that goes around the harbour doing tours for tourists. And again, he um, engages a lot of the young boys in activities on that boat. So actually, there's two things that go on there. One is just the simple thing of having healthy activities for kids after school so they're not bored, that are particularly focused on boys, and both run by very good, strong male influences for these kids. Um, so over time, there's also been quite a bit of work done by the Redfern Police in building its relationship with the elders in the community, including with Mick Mundine and Shane. Um, but it has been a real community um, and collaborative effort and shows that that investment in um, uh, developing self-esteem and healthy activity with kids is actually not rocket science, but something that can be really easily done by communities thinking about these issues. So that is actually a key part of the core of what I want to talk about in terms of what works, that when I look through the research and some of the other examples I'm going to talk to you about um, tonight, you'll see that where we found solutions that actually work, a key component of them have been that it's been members of the Aboriginal community often working in collaboration, the reference example I just used is with the police, but with schools to come up with solutions that really work for some problems that people think are completely intractable in communities that people have kind of written off as being too hard. Um, but they seem to be the, the place where we see the most innovative um, solutions um, rather than the top-down approach of people deciding things in Quarry Street or in Canberra and imposing them into communities. And you know, these, these two programs I just mentioned are not resource neutral, but they haven't required huge amounts of money. Um, and the rainbow, um, the tribal warrior, sorry, is um, an activity or an enterprise that funds itself and, and there, there are ways in which they're able to do this. This isn't throwing lots of money at the problem, but actually supporting what communities are doing. So if you look at those as a couple of examples, you can then look and see where sometimes the policy approach goes completely in contradiction with what communities have developed in terms of what works. Now, I want to use the example of bilingual education. Now, bilingual education is a model that's a really useful and workable model in communities where Aboriginal languages are a first language. So, not so much places like Sydney or Newcastle where you wouldn't have that dynamic, but in places where it, um, Aboriginal languages would be the first, sometimes second, even third language that's spoken at home. Communities developed, especially through the Northern Territory, a model of bilingual education that saw them bring the teachers who were coming into their communities, come in and have to learn the language, and then co-teach with um, people from the community in the classroom. Um, so that children learned to read and write um, using the, their own language, but it gave them a familiarity with letters so that when they come to um, read English, it's much easier for them to do that. Um, so the purpose of bilingual education is not just to, to keep children learning in their own language, it's also specifically designed to teach them English so that they can be much more proficient in engaging with the broader community, um, but it uses knowledge of one's own um, language as a stepping stone for that. There are a couple of other huge 
key benefits that you might have picked up from that model of bilingual education. One is that teachers have to spend a lot of time with the community, so they tend to build up trust with the local community and the local parents. They get really integrated into the community, so it's not like an outsider coming in. And the other thing you might have picked up is this idea of co-teaching. There'll often be a couple of parents from the community that come into the school to assist with the bilingual education model. Um, it's a great way of bringing the broader community into the school and helping the rest of the community trust the teachers in the school. And that becomes, I think, an interesting um, dynamic. Bilingual education um, was basically outlawed by the Northern Territory Government on the basis that they thought it was, should be compulsory that children speak English for the first three hours of their, of their time in school. Um, so they basically uh, underfunded it and banned it, um, much to the disappointment of the communities themselves, um, but with a result that gave even worse outcomes in terms of education for the children. And it's not surprising because there has been some research that shows what does work in terms of engaging Aboriginal children with um, learning. And again, as it's often I think quite easily dismiss the issues, the challenges around bringing Indigenous children into a classroom and keeping them there, that that's, that's primarily a problem for, that is a result of bad parenting. And you hear that kind of rhetoric when we hear examples of where truancy is linked to welfare reform. So if your kids don't go to school, you don't get your welfare payment. And that's the other people think, well, that's, that's fine. You know, that sounds like it's a pretty good policy approach. But if you look at the reason why children don't go to school and what actually does engage them in school, you start to perhaps see why I've come to a conclusion that that has been a very detrimental policy. Studies that have looked at why Aboriginal children don't go to school, particularly in communities where there is a high truancy rate, will have identified primarily the issues of um, the culture of the school, that the, they don't, the children don't feel um, welcome in the school or it's hostile. Um, that's particularly so if they have English as a second or third language and most of their teaching is done in English and they're not quite keeping up. They're not, they're not assertive enough to say that they don't understand and they just start to slip away. Which goes to another reason which is the quality of the teaching. In some families that would have been uh, parts of studies you see five children a couple of the kids might go to school quite often and then other kids won't go at all. So it's not clear that it's a particular family dynamic, but the, what can often account for it is the interaction that the teacher has with the children. And just, I know it's probably even a common sense thing as we've all had a favourite teacher who somehow engaged us with education in a way. And that's the sort of dynamic that we see working. And the other issue is, of course, the quality of all the nature of that engages children as well. Then after that comes the issue of parental attitudes towards um, education. And as I said, there are other issues that I referred to at the beginning around overcrowding and health that are also in effect. But I think what the point I really like to stress is when we look at the reasons why kids don't go to school, you can see that just simply saying this is a parental problem is never going to be a way to fix the issues. Um, it's known that there are quite a few things that do work to get kids into classrooms and they're often again very simple things. Um, breakfast and lunch programs that have been set up by schools, kids come in, especially if they are from a dysfunctional, dysfunctional family, going without breakfast. These have been a really great way to get kids to feel like the school is a second home. Programs like elders in residence programs that bring a member of the community into the school so the kids have a particular face there and someone they know if there's any issues or somebody that they can talk to that they trust. Even more than that, having Aboriginal teacher a teacher's aides in the classroom teaching with the teachers and of course the development of um, a, a professional class of Aboriginal teachers as well has also assisted. And then again, in the, the use of curriculum that engages kids because it engages with cultural ideas that, that they understand. And again, I just highlight that when we see these programs that work, um, they're not rocket science, but the thing that they all have in common is it's usually the communities and the families working together. And you can see how another thing through that is building up the relationship.
relationship between the school and the community so that there's a, a fluid interaction and trust there. Um, so just as I've already used the bilingual education um, idea as an issue, but when, I, when we look at why we spend so much money on Indigenous issues but it doesn't get anywhere, um, when the Northern Territory intervention was first rolled out, one of the issues that was set to be targeting was truancy in schools. It introduced a welfare reform agenda, but at its first stage took $80 million to implement just the bureaucracy. Not money going to communities, just to set up the infrastructure within the, within the bureaucracy cost $80 million. But not a single dollar was sent, spent on any of those programs I just mentioned. None of the breakfast and lunch programs, no investment in teachers or developing Aboriginal people into teachers, none of those sorts of things. So I think one of the things that becomes very frustrating is when you look at these things that actually work, the top-down approach, which is often where a lot of the money gets spent, doesn't seem to connect with it. So I just, um, in some of the time I have left tonight, I want to leave some time for questions, so I'm just going to move to um, make the other key point I wanted to make tonight about education, is that um, a lot of what I've just spoken about concentrates on the importance of educating Indigenous young people. But I think what we often do is we focus on trying to fix that part of the problem, the pipeline problem, and fail to appreciate that within the broader Aboriginal community, um, partly because of the uh, policies in the past that excluded Aboriginal people from higher education, um, but uh, for a range of other reasons. Um, the potential to further skill up um, older Indigenous people, so not just our children, is something that we don't concentrate on enough. And we'll often hear university sectors say, well, it's difficult for us to improve our numbers until we have more Aboriginal kids coming through schools. Um, now, that's, um, there, are a lot, there are some universities that do quite a lot of work to do that sort of skilling up that I talked about earlier. So I don't see that as not part of their responsibility. But that attitude seems to overlook the fact that there are large pools of Aboriginal people within the broader community that will benefit from um, more skilling and more education. And I'll tell you why I think that that's such an important thing, not just, just um, for the state's sake of raising the statistics around education. There's a fundamental reason why that skilling is the important part of closing the gap. In all of the studies that we look at, especially with health, um, that show an improvement in the um, situation of Aboriginal people so that it becomes quite, uh, closer to that of um, the broader Australian community, there is one particular thing, element that goes through, those, through, the, through that research and it resonates with similar research in North America, in Canada and the United States. And it says that to have the best results, you need to have Aboriginal people centrally involved in the policy making around their own, um, own, own issues in their community and centrally involved in the development of programs that come into their community and centrally involved in the rollout of those um, communities. And in some ways, again, that sounds like common sense. You'd be aware that across the country, um, Aboriginal communities are very different. Your community here is different to my community, which is different to Yundamu, which is different to the Torres Strait. And there is really no one size fits all. And having local community engaged with these activities of policy making and program delivery allows for a much more custom fit um, to occur with how particularly programs are rolled out. But it's more than that, it allows the people within the community to use their informal links with other networks. It puts a face on that makes the community feel comfortable to go in the doors of the service. So there are a whole range of things that are needed. And um, if we understand that that is a central part, then I think we need to meet the challenge of ensuring Aboriginal communities have the capacity to meet the expectations that they will take in that sort of capacity building. And I don't think we do enough to think about broader capacity building in the community. And I say that not just for the Indigenous community, but I think more broadly, if 
we think more broadly about the challenges around the civil society and how you empower disadvantaged groups. That issue of capacity building is something that policy makers don't think about very often. But I might just um, finish with an observation from one of the research projects I've currently been working on, which kind of summed up for me in a much more anecdotal way this particular idea um, that of the need to really have an empowered community and the challenge we need to think about in how we actually create that, but also where it exists, making sure we preserve it. Because I think one of the things we do badly with Indigenous issues is we'll often respond to the crisis and we don't think about investing in the long-term solutions. It's partly a, a, a flow-up from our political cycle, it's partly a flow-up from the budget cycle, but generally we respond to crisis and don't worry about long-term investment. Um, I've used, recently been involved with a research project that looked at six communities in New South Wales, three with high crime rates and three with low crime rates. So we looked at Kempsey and Gunnada, it turns out Kempsey, uh, but Gunnada is actually not a low crime rate but an underreported crime rate, so that's less than about statistics for you. Um, Lightning Region Berg, but we'll, and also Kenya and Menindi. And when you reflect on what it is that makes a difference between communities with high crime rates and communities with low crime rates, communities that are functional and communities that have a lot of dysfunction in them, um, there was one thing that seemed to really sum up what the heart of the problem was. Um, when you would ask people in um, Kenya, what do you do about the issue of children not going to school, people would say, well, there's not much we can do. The principles are racist. The PNC don't like the Aboriginal community. Um, the, we've complained to, um, to, the, to the council, but they said it's not their problem. And what's the point anyway? Because no Aboriginal person has ever been employed in the main street stores anyway, so what's the point? You ask the same question to people in Menindi. What do you do when kids don't go to school? And they say, well, we keep an eye on them, and if they don't turn up to school, Arnie Beryl gets in the bus and she goes down to the riverbank, because that's where they all muck around, to put them in the bus and we take them to school. And in those two different answers, I think is the heart of what explains the differences in those communities. A community where, regardless of their resources, and I can tell you there is a lot of funding and programs and pilot programs that go into it Kenya, in the face of all of that, you still have a group of people who, when they see a problem, don't feel they have the capacity to solve it. Compared to Menindi, where you have a group of very strong people leading their community, where they see a problem, they never doubt that they have the ability to solve that themselves without any help from outside. And at the heart of it, that's the kind of capacity building that seems to make all the difference. I just leave with one final note that perplexes me and again goes to that issue about the fact that the, the throwing of the money of the problem is really not the solution. Um, well, Kenya, as I mentioned, because it's seen as a basket case community, often has a lot of programs that are done as pilot programs and short-term funding. And one thing that our research picked up that I don't think we've been fully able to explain yet, but it's an interesting and perhaps disturbing phenomenon, but it seemed as though that injection of short-term funding, and particularly the putting in of a program and then pulling it out, the pilot program and then not refunding it, the setting up of something and then, and then pulling it away, was much more um, disruptive to that community than in India, which because it's not a community that's seen as a problem, often gets ignored, doesn't get nearly the same amount of attention in the pilot projects. And I'll finish with just this one anecdote that kind of summed that up. Um, there was a recent um, government program that built um, for schools, and probably trying to do exactly what we achieved at Redfern with the two after school programs, of setting up a community, a kind of hall at the school, so that the people could do after school programs there. They didn't provide the programs, they were just going to provide the hall. And one was built in um, or came here and no one used it. They came to an Indian and said, we want to build a school hall. And they said, well, what do we want a school hall for? Without, you know, 
and they actually said, this community that is not rich, they said, if you don't bring the program in the way we want it, we don't want it at all. And to me, that showed the level of empowerment you kind of need to give a community for them to feel like they're able to resolve their own problems. I look at that example and I see those women who take that staunch view of not wanting handouts and not wanting things that aren't going to work their way. And the word that comes to my mind is self-determination. And I know that's a very controversial word, but at the end of the day, I think for me that's kind of the concept that the key for education really has to be, the end result, has to be about building up those communities and giving them those capacities, especially where you see a place like Mulcanyan where it's really been whittled away, where we see it in many 